It was Benjamin Franklin who said in 1789 that in this world, nothing is certain but death and taxes. Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Some of us, uh, we might prefer to say death by taxes. Uh, In our passage this morning, Matthew links these two subjects together as he recounts for us two incidents in the life of Jesus where he speaks about both death and taxes. And of course, Matthew would have been very interested in the subject of taxes, wouldn't he? He was a former tax collector. And it's no accident, surely, that in the four gospel accounts, it is Matthew and Matthew alone who has recorded for us this conversation about tax in verses 24 to 27. And I just wonder if when the subject came up, I just wonder if the other disciples reacted the same way many of us do when the subject turns to to tax returns or P60s or pensions or national insurance and there's this glazed look that that comes over the eyes. Uh, Much of the conversation sailing over our heads. Not Matthew. Not Matthew. He's a figures man. He is a financial keen being. And so of course he's going to remember and he's going to retell this conversation for us. But that's not to say this discussion about tax is first and foremost about finance. Rather, Jesus uses this discussion really as a springboard uh, to establish a principle, uh, to teach us a lesson really in how we relate to those in authority over us. Uh, And in doing so, he gives us one of his strangest of all miracles The catching of a fish with a coin in its mouth. And boys and girls, you have a great picture for you to colour in at the back of the page today. A picture of a man catching a fish with a coin in its mouth. Uh, So this passage, it is not just only suited to accountants and financial advisors. Uh, This is important for all of us this morning. I want to divide uh, the, the, the verses into three parts. Uh, Jesus predicting his death and resurrection. Jesus paying his tax. And Jesus providing the fish. Jesus predicting his death and resurrection. Paying his tax and providing the fish. Three parts for us this morning. So firstly, his predicting his death and resurrection. And there were times in his ministry when Jesus did speak very openly, plainly, clearly about his upcoming sufferings, his his death, his resurrection. Times when he predicted it in conversation with his disciples. The first isn't that long before this incident, at the end of Matthew 16. Uh, We have Peter's climactic profession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And fairly soon after that, we read 16 verse 21. Jesus began to show his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem to suffer, be killed and raised on the third day. And then in 17 verse 12. Coming down the the Mount of Transfiguration. uh, There's another little passing reference to his future sufferings. But here in verses 22 and 23 of chapter 17. he, He really elaborates. He goes into a little more detail. We read. He said to them. The son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And he will be raised on the third day. Now he will only speak one more time. About his upcoming death and sufferings. 
Uh, that's in chapter 20, 17 to 19. Uh, that is to say, uh, this isn't something he spoke very regularly about. We just have a few references when he gives some insight to the painful details that lay ahead. And each time it seems that there are different elements uh, emphasized. On the first occasion, uh, it was the certainty of his death that's emphasized. The necessity, uh, 16 verse 21, he spoke of how he must go. He must go and suffer and be killed. Now, in our verses this morning, the emphasis is on how this will come about. He says, the Son of Man is about to be delivered. And that seems the key word, delivered into the hands of men. That is, he will be handed over from one to the other. Little did the disciples think that Judas, standing among them, uh, would himself deliver Jesus into the hands of men. Or the scribes, chief priests, Pharisees and Sadducees, how they would deliver Jesus into the hands of men. Or, or the civil leaders of Israel, how they would deliver Jesus into the hands of men. Or the Roman rulers who would deliver Jesus into the hands of the centurions who would inflict the final punishment. Do you see time and time again Jesus would be delivered, handed over into the hands of wicked men. And ultimately behind it all, behind it all it would be his father delivering him. It would be his father delivering him into those hands. Uh, Romans 8 verse 32 speaks of the father not sparing his own son, but delivering him up for us all. Peter in his sermon in Acts 2 puts it, Jesus was delivered up. Delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So the Heavenly Father for our salvation. Delivering up, delivering over his beloved son into the hands of men. A striking phrase. He would be delivered. We see not only the necessity of his death. But that this suffering and death was the very plan of God for us. It wasn't merely an accident. It wasn't a tragedy be out of control. It was perfectly in control. The Father's eternal plan and purpose. Willingly taken up by the Son. Suffering. Dying for you and for me. And Jesus doesn't stop there in this little prediction. He goes on to speak of his resurrection. Verse 23. He will be raised on the third day. He had already mentioned his resurrection in chapter 16. Uh, the response of the disciples then was sheer indignation. Uh, Peter spoke up. He said, this shall never happen to you, Lord. He began to rebuke Jesus. That's not the response this time. Uh, Matthew tells us, end of verse 23... They were greatly distressed, the disciples. A strong phrase. Plunged into grief at the prospect of, of losing Jesus. And it really seems that the reference to the resurrection means little to these men. Uh, they, they didn't understand it really. How, how could they? All they heard and all they picked up was Jesus speaking of his death. They only saw part of the picture and they were greatly distressed. And it's a wonderful reminder to us this morning, friends, of the importance of the resurrection. The importance of the resurrection. If Jesus had stayed crucified, we would be well to be greatly distressed this morning. If he had only died for sin, we wouldn't know at all 
if his death had been accepted by the Father. We wouldn't know if the Father was satisfied with the Son. And our faith, Paul would say, would be futile, useless, pointless if he only died. But we remember today, he has been raised from the dead. Hallelujah! He is risen today, friends. This very day of the week in which we gather for worship is a, is a weekly reminder that he is risen. He's a living saviour. Some of us, some of us, we perhaps live and think like these distressed disciples. And we go about uh, living a half-baked Christian life, really. Because we're missing the fact that he's risen. Uh, we're overlooking the fact that he's risen. Uh, we're forgetting the fact that he is risen. It's absolutely vital to the gospel message. So Jesus predicting his death and resurrection. First part of the section today. Jesus predicting his death and resurrection. But then secondly, Jesus paying his tax. Paying his tax. We move in verse 24 to Capernaum. Uh, this was essentially the epicenter of Christ's earthly ministry. His operational HQ headquarters. Uh, we know Peter lived here. This was Peter's hometown, Capernaum. And so it's, it's no real surprise that when Jesus and the disciples come back to Capernaum, they've been away for some time, but they come back and they are approached by the local tax collectors. Verse 24, when they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? Now, to be clear, these weren't the typical tax collectors of the day gathering for the Roman authorities. Uh, this wasn't the equivalent of property or income tax. This was different. This was a religious tax. A, a religious tax. These were Jewish tax collectors gathering the Jewish drachma tax, uh, otherwise known as the temple tax. The temple tax, based on a law from Exodus 30, where every male Israelite, 20 years or older, uh, they were responsible to pay this tax. Two drachmas for the upkeep of the temple, uh, sometimes also known as the ransom tax. So drachma tax, temple tax, ransom tax, all the same. Two drachmas uh, was the equivalent of two days' wages. And this was on top of the normal and usual tithes. Uh, so pricey enough, really. Pricey enough. Uh, temple worship had expenses. Uh, this would have covered things like sustaining the priests who worked there. Uh, the provision of animals for sacrifices, a uh, significant expense. Uh, the maintenance of the buildings themselves. And so here's Jesus and disciples having been away for some time. But they come back to Capernaum. It's not surprising is that these tax collectors, they show up and they ask Peter, well, is Jesus planning on paying the annual sum this year? And Peter responds with one word. Yes, yes, he might have seen Jesus pay this tax before. We don't know exactly, but, but Peter knows Jesus pays his tax. He is unhesitating in his response. End of discussion for now. Because as Peter enters the house, Jesus continues the discussion. We thought about that with the boys and girls. Jesus knows what has been said. He continues the discussion. Uh, before Peter can even get a word out of his mouth, Jesus is already asking him about tax. Uh, verse 25, he, he poses a scenario to Peter. What do you think, Simon? 
From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? Peter, let me ask you a question. Uh, Do the kings of the earth, do they take tax from their family? Or do they take tax from strangers and citizens? Peter answers, well, well, from the strangers, from from the citizens, uh, from non-family members. Of course, kings don't tax their family, Jesus. Jesus responds, then the sons are free. That's right, Peter. Uh, The sons of the king are free from having to pay tax. Now, what's the point? What's going on here? Well, Jesus is pointing out to Peter that because of his unique relationship to to God, because God is his heavenly father, Jesus himself is exempt from paying tax. Remember the transfiguration not long before this, Fresh in Peter's memory, and that voice from the cloud, the father saying, this is my beloved son. This is my son. Jesus is God's son, the son of the king. And as such, he should certainly be exempt from paying this temple tax. Uh, Peter might also have remembered that back in chapter 12, verse 6, Jesus described himself as greater than the temple. Greater than the temple. And when you think of what this tax was used for, covering the cost of offerings and sacrifices, surely it further underlines his exemption. Jesus would offer himself as the final sacrifice. Essentially, he's explaining, he is is under no obligation To pay this temple tax because of who he is. Sons are free, Peter. Sons are free. But notice how he speaks of sons plural. Plural. That is to say, Peter or James, Jesus is including Peter in this freedom. He's including all those who've been adopted into the family of God in this freedom. Sons, we are free, Peter. We are free from this. Galatians 5 verse 1 puts it, For freedom Christ has set us free. As believers in Christ, we aren't strangers or foreigners in the kingdom of God. We are sons and daughters of the king, friends. We are free. Peter would later write, and it's interesting it would be Peter after this discussion. 1 Peter 2, 16. Live as people who are free. We're free from guilt. Free from the wrath to come. Free from the curse of the law. Free from the dominion of sin. But free also from The unbiblical and unfair expectations of other people. Free from the assumptions of other people. And so Peter might well have been expecting Jesus to then say, We're free from this, Peter. So let's not pay the tax this year. But it's interesting. Because that is not what Jesus says. He follows up, verse 27 With a very important qualification. Sons are free. Verse 27. However. Some translations have. But or nevertheless. Uh, Yes. As sons and daughters were free Peter. We are under no obligation. To the rulers of this world. We are citizens of a higher kingdom. A heavenly kingdom. Technically, we don't need to jump through their hoops. We don't need to dance to their tune. However, but nevertheless, despite that, Peter, go and pay the tax. We aren't obligated, Peter. We are are free. We are free men and women. However, go and pay the tax. Why? Jesus says, 
so that we do not cause offense. What a powerful message this is. How, how timely and relevant and how countercultural. We live in a day when people value their freedom greatly. People want to protect their freedom, their liberty, their autonomy. Uh, the spirit of our age is an age of independence. Individualism. This is a free country you'll hear. Nobody is going to tell me what to do. I'm in control of my life. I'm free to do what I want to do. You cannot walk over my rights. But listen to Jesus. I am a free man. But I will set aside my rights. And I will freely submit to this tax expectation. This custom. So that I give no offense. So that I might not give any cause for anyone needlessly stumbling over the gospel. A striking thing. In our day of liberty and independence. To, to note here Christ's willingness to make concessions rather than give offense. He could easily, he could easily have claimed exemption. And he would have been absolutely right to. But he pays the tax so that he might not give offense. It's much like how Paul would put it, 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, he, he says, am I not free? Am I not free? And he goes on, do I not have this right and that right? Nevertheless, he says... Verse 12, 1 Corinthians 9. We have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. Very, very similar. We endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. Is there not much for us to learn from this attitude, friends? Are there not times when as followers of Christ... We can and we should forego our own opinions, lay aside our own preferences, and even submit to other people's requirements so as to not give offense, so as to not hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not, not saying we compromise on issues of obedience to Christ. This is really what you might call those gray areas. Issues that are not sinful in and of themselves. Times when we can choose to do something we're not obligated to do, but we do it for the sake of the gospel. When we do things that maybe others expect, maybe it's custom or the culture, uh, the, the, simply the expectation of some people, and we do it simply because we don't want to give offense to them. Simply because we don't want our behavior to be an unnecessary stumbling block for them coming to Christ. That's not easy to give specific examples here. I know you all would love me to give specifics here. It's not easy. It's a kind of thing that will look different in every context, every culture. And it will look different in every individual life, even every individual household. It might be to do with things that we eat or not eat. Things we drink or don't drink. Places we go or don't go. It might be about what we wear. What we don't wear. Uh, the way we relate to each other. As long as the cause of the gospel is first and foremost. God's rights we may never give up. But ours we may safely give up. Choosing not to hold on to some liberty we have, some gospel freedom, if it might be a stumbling block for someone hearing and understanding the gospel of Jesus. That's the second thing, Jesus paying his tax. But how did he do it? Because Jesus was much like some of us here in church this morning Jesus never really carried much cash. 
Uh, it seems that Jesus did not carry money really at all. Uh, he hardly had a penny to his name. Uh, and actually later in Matthew, uh, the Pharisees tried to trap him. He told them, give to Caesars what is Caesars. But he first had to say, bring me a coin. Bring me a coin. He didn't have cash. It's much the same here. He's no money on him. And so he has to direct Peter how to pay the tax. So let's come thirdly. Jesus providing the fish. Providing the fish. We finally come to the miracle. And it is an odd one to say the least. Verse 27. Jesus tells Peter, Go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. This is an astounding miracle. Uh, think of all that had to happen for this miracle to take place. Someone first of all dropping this coin into the water in the first place. And then a fish uh, somehow grabbing this coin. Not swallowing it but keeping it in its mouth. And this fish then to be swimming in just the right place where Peter is dropping the hook. And this same fish grabbing the hook before any other fish would. Jesus said it would be the first fish that comes up. An amazing miracle. Doesn't it remind us? Doesn't it speak to us of how God can provide for our needs? In any way he wants. Any way he wants. Sometimes in surprising ways. Unexpected ways. Even miraculous ways. Not that he will always work a miracle to get you out of some scrape. But he will work with omnipotent power. To meet all of your needs in the pathway of freedom and love. A graphic picture of our need to trust the Lord's providence to supply for all our needs, especially when we're walking in the path of duty. It was Hudson Taylor, a great missionary to China in the 19th century. He put it, depend on this, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. The Lord Jesus didn't have this money. It appears Peter didn't have this money either. But to save offense, the Lord provides, and he provides through the mouth of this fish, exactly what is needed. Note that. Exactly what is needed. No more, no less. A shekel, our Bibles tell us. Your Bible might have a footnote which gives another name for this coin. A stator, uh, that is a silver coin worth how much? Four drachmas. Hmm. Four drachmas. This was a two drachma tax. So here's this coin which covers the cost for both Jesus and Peter. Uh, that is to say, with this miraculous catch, the Lord graciously provides for both him and Peter. Isn't there something incredibly fitting about it? Jesus paying the price for Peter. Jesus paying the ransom tax for Peter. Jesus paying the debt that was Peter's. And doesn't it speak to us of his work on the cross? Pretty much all religions have some concept of human failure and debt to be paid. Uh, because God has made us with a conscience. And even though we might not know how good God is, uh, we know how bad we are. Basically every religion except Christianity says you need to pay back your debt. 
You need to pay back your debt. Hinduism, uh, you need to reincarnate and suffer to pay off your debt to karma. Islam, your good works need to outweigh your bad works so you can pay off your debt to Allah. But in the Bible, when it comes to our record of debt, rather than making us pay, God, we read God sent his son to pay the debt. And how did Jesus make payment for our sins? How did he pay the ransom tax? By giving his own life as a ransom. Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man, he says, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as what? As a ransom for many. Or Colossians 2, 14 speaks of him. Cancelling the record of debt against us. Cancelling the record of debt. He lived the life we could never live. Died the death we should die. And he paid the price we could never pay. And again, interestingly, it would be Peter who would write later. 1 Peter 1. We have been ransomed. Not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Do you see, with this amazing miracle, strange as it is, Jesus pays in full the ransom price for Peter. And this morning we can say that at the cross... Another miracle took place. And he paid in full the ransom price for you and for me. It's what we sang about in Psalm 49. Soul's redemption costly is money never could buy this. That from death you will be free and decay will never see. But God will redeem my soul. He will surely keep me whole from the power of the grave. He himself will me receive. Just as this one coin covered both him and Peter, so his payment at the cross covers us this morning. So friends, this morning, give thanks for this wonderful provision. He has paid what we ourselves owe. He has paid your debt. A debt that you could never begin to pay. And he's paid it. And he's paid it all. Peter could say that. It's all covered. It's all covered. He has paid it all, friends. Death and taxes. Normally there's nothing good or positive to say about death or taxes. Praise God this morning, friends. There is something positive. There is good news when Jesus speaks about death and taxes. Good news of great joy. He has paid it all. Amen.